Do you think that there is going to be a war between China and Taiwan? Um, well, let's put a timeline on it. I do not think so in the next five years. And there are things that Taiwan and the U.S. could do to lower that probability further. Dr. Kara Stempelman is a research fellow at Stanford University Hoover Institution, where he serves as the program manager of the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific. Today, we will be talking about his view on the upcoming Taiwanese presidential election and foreign policy objectives from both the U.S. and Taiwan. Hope you guys will enjoy the conversation. Let's just start with the upcoming 2024 Taiwanese presidential election. I'm curious as to what extent does predictability of the candidates matter for the U.S. government and which candidate, in your opinion, is more favorable in the eyes of the U.S. government? Uh, well, uh, the U.S. government has long prioritized having candidates who are reliable, uh, who follow through on their commitments, and most importantly, are not the source of surprises in the bilateral relationship. And uh, so there's a, a history here um, during the Bush administration, the, the Bush Jr. administration, um, their relationship with Chen Shui-bian and his government mm -hmm. started out in a very good place. And then Chun, for domestic political reasons, uh, increasingly moved towards uh, trying to use Taiwan nationalism or um, uh, referendums or changes of names to uh, to uh, kind of bolster his own political standing in Taiwan. And he had a habit of doing that without uh, informing or consulting the U.S. first. Uh, and that, of course, would provoke a, a strong reaction from Beijing. And so by the end of the Chen Shui-bian era, George W. Bush, uh, there, there was very little communication or trust uh, with Chen Shui-bian. And so since then, the mantra from the U.S. side has been no surprises. If you're going to do something that might affect our interests in our relationship with China or with Taiwan, let us know first. And we'd, we'd like to be consulted and uh, potentially we'd like to uh, shape your message a little bit. Uh, if the U.S. is going to be on the hook for defending Taiwan, I think that's a, a reasonable request. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so... Uh, so that being the background, then uh, looking at the the three candidates now, um, I, it, this is an unfair standard to beat. But none, none of them are at the point where they can live up to the level of trust and understanding that Tsai Ing-wen has developed with the U.S. So mm -hmm. Tsai right now has a great relationship with the Biden administration, and uh, there's a, a deep level of understanding and trust between our two sides and regardless of whether it's William Lai or Hoyo Yi or Ko Wenjia, uh, whoever comes into office after her is not going to have that same level of trust initially, at least, and simply because they're they're less well known in the U.S. So I don't think the U.S. has a clear favorite in this race. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, the the bottom line for the United States is we'd like to like someone who respects U.S. interests and who uh, is uh, predictable and a reliable partner in the, in this relationship. I just from my personal view, I've mm -hmm. always thought that Xiao was the connection, sort of, sort of like the way Tsai mm -hmm. connects with the U.S. And now she's running as the vice president. Um, so I thought it would carry over to Lai uh, to an extent. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I th it certainly helps, and it was one of the reasons I think William Lai picked Xiao is that uh, she does have that. Uh, she's she's a star in Washington, really. She's got a lot of soft power, a lot of influence, and in, in a, a big Rolodex. Um, and so her presence on the ticket helps to some degree. But the vice presidential slot has no power <laughs> uh, on its mm -hmm. own. It's entirely up to the president what the VP can and will do. And so. Um, there's still a little bit of wariness, I think, of Lai and his uh, past statements about Taiwan independence and um, the uh, his uh, he he's done a very good job, I should say, over the last six months of staying on message and and trying to demonstrate that he will walk the same road that Tsai Ing-wen has walked and be basically Tsai Ing-wen 2.0. And hmm. 
uh, choosing Xiao, I think, reinforces that message. So there's a, a greater level of comfort in the U.S. government with his possible presidency than there was six months ago. Um, so based on that, do you think the U.S. would still exert its soft power over elections like this? And do you think that um, the PRC would do the same thing, too, during this election? Yeah, so uh, the U.S position on elections in other democratic countries has generally been to be uh, to be neutral, right? And that there's a very practical reason for that. Uh, if, uh, if the voters deliver, in our view, the wrong candidate to, mm -hmm. to power, the U.S. still has to work with that administration. Uh, and so uh, it's unusual for the U.S., even privately, the U.S. government, even privately to signal that it uh, has concerns about one candidate or another. Um, and uh, I think this election is no different. So the uh, Biden administration, uh, you're probably aware that uh, Laura Rosenberger, the chairwoman of AIT, uh, yeah. she's, she's a fairly recent appointee to that position. And she has a, an atypical background for that position. So she was previously at the White House working as part of the National Security Council. She's not a foreign service career, career foreign service officer. She doesn't speak Chinese. Um, and uh, she's not, you know, uh, deeply familiar with Taiwan. And so the, the reason she was appointed there, and it was a, a very kind of deliberate signal, was to indicate that the White House was very interested in this election and wanted to open up another channel to connect with all three candidates uh, and communicate the U.S.'s interests in this election privately. And uh, so I, I would believe her when she says the U.S. doesn't have a, a favorite in this election. Um, mm -hmm. And that uh, the, the U.S. is prepared to work well with whichever candidate wins. I see. Um, circling back to sort of the political landscapes of Taiwanese elections, um, I think due to the complexities of cross-trade relations, in my opinion, most voters vote based on a political party's China policy. Um, do you think that's true? And if it is, does Taiwanese voters have a tendency to overlook domestic policies during elections as a result? Yeah, this is a, a topic, a question of hot debate right now in the Taiwan Watcher community. How much of the election outcome will be driven by domestic factors versus cross-strait relations? And I I think you always have to start with cross-strait relations as the it's the clear issue that divides the political parties. Um, it's the issue that uh, the U.S. is most concerned about. It's certainly the issue that Beijing is most concerned about. And the whole party system is kind of <laughs> uh, oriented around uh, the approach to cross-strait relations. Um, uh, but over the last four years or so, we've seen a fair amount of fatigue with, especially among younger voters, about the kind of traditional pitches of both the major parties uh, in terms of cross-strait relations. And so um, there are lots of domestic issues that have bubbled up that are, I think, acting as a drag on the DPP ticket right now. So um, the economy slowed down this past year, uh, inflation's been high, uh, wages have uh, not kept pace with inflation, especially for young people just entering the job market. Uh, it's very hard to imagine buying a house if you're uh, under 40 and just entering the job market and trying to save up for that down payment. Um, there's, uh, you know, environmental challenges, energy challenges, um, uh, some conflicts over social policy, conflicts over you know, just traffic and quality of life issues. And the DPP is as and it's not really related to the fact that they're the pro or the the kind of china skeptical party or the the more independence leaning party they're the incumbent party and so after eight years of dpp rule they're really on the hook if people are unhappy with the way things have gone over the last eight years you can't really point your finger at anybody else to blame but the dpp because they're the government um and so i think uh there's a um I guess one way to answer this question is to think of older versus younger voters. And I think younger voters are much more concerned about things other than cross-strait relations. And also they're less partisan. They're 
less fully committed to one camp or the other, and they may make a big difference in this election because they're so fickle. They may switch uh, between all three candidates. <laughs> you know, wow. so um, yeah. So I would say cross trade issues is certainly how the party structures orient uh, the, the party uh, system is structured. Uh, it's um, the issue that's going to drive a lot of voting behavior in the older voting groups, uh, but among young voters, they may care about other issues and they may decide to vote based on those other issues. Yeah, I see. Um, thank you for your answer. Because I remember during the Chen administration, Chen shui bin administration, uh, at the end of the eight-year administration, there was like this initiative that was put in place where he stopped the electricity price, I'm pretty sure, and it was carried on to it was carried on to the Ma administration. And mm -hmm. we sort of got this three to four months period where Ma could basically sort of use Chen Shui-bian as a scapegoat for, you right. know, right. high electricity crisis. Right. Um, do you think that that's going to be the same if the KMT or TPP took over? And how does that actually impact um, the, I guess, the promises made by these uh, parties? Yeah, um, it's an interesting question. The my general sense is that uh, the the Tsai administration at this point um, has had some significant wins in terms of uh, policy successes. So uh, a big one is uh, they're actually um, they're on a fiscally sustainable path right now. So. Um, They've actually paid down a little bit of debt. Uh, the budget uh, that just passed a, a few days ago in the legislature is um, seems to be fiscally sound. Uh, so there is some room that, that you know the Tsai administration is not handing the next president uh, a crisis in waiting, where the next president is going to have to come in and slash a bunch of spending to balance the budget. Um, you know, Taiwan's macroeconomic policies have been uh, quite conservative for many, many years. And so the next president's going to benefit from that as well. Um, TSMC and the semiconductor industry are uh, booming um, and they're really, uh, you know, they're, they're a bigger and bigger share of the economy. And uh, right now that's helping uh, Taiwan's economy overall. Um, and so in the near run, at least, I don't think that's a, a crisis in waiting, but there are some kind of deeper concerns about being so overly reliant on one industry. Um, I, you know, I did my graduate work in Michigan, and Michigan was uh, mm -hmm. very heavily reliant on the auto industry. And when the auto industry, sure, yeah. when all of the the companies there uh, went through a, a you know an, a crisis at the same time, then the entire state of Michigan's economy went into a deep, deep recession. And so I worry a little bit about. Uh, Taiwan's uh, potential over-reliance on this industry that that can be fairly volatile. Um, and so that's a potential problem that the Tsai administration is passing on, but it doesn't look like an imminent crisis, right? Um, so so on, on those things, I think uh, the next president will have a, a nice hand to work with. Um, the energy issues in Taiwan, I think, are a more serious and intractable set of problems, and there's no easy solution to Taiwan's, uh, I would call it massive over-dependence on imported fossil fuels. Um, the Tsai administration has said repeatedly that they were trying to transition away from both nuclear power and fossil fuels and ramp up renewables, uh, but they've run into a bunch of hurdles. They haven't met their targets for that. And the next president is going to have to face reality in a way that this administration, I don't think, fully has. Um, so that's that's one area where uh, and you see this uh, in the candidates' uh, pledges to extend nuclear power. Two of the three have said they would actually, you know, uh, extend the life of the last couple nuclear reactors in Taiwan to to help fill this shortfall. Well, that was such an interesting point because I, I I've been always really curious as to um, the nuclear energy policies in Taiwan. Because what if we let's say a KMT or TPP uh, presidential candidate just won the election, but mm -hmm. Congress has a DPP majority, how are, are they going to actually make this work? Yeah, excellent question. Um, there's 
for those of us who've followed Taiwan politics for decades, there's this uh, concern bordering on fear that we get back to the Chen Shui-bian era where you had divided government and a lot of mm -hmm. gridlock and just dysfunction in policymaking. And um, I think those fears are probably overstated in some circles uh, simply because uh, if the issue is not cross-strait relations, the legislature actually has a, a pattern of working pretty well to pass consensus legislation. So it's it's not well known outside of Taiwan or even inside of Taiwan, but the majority of bills that pass the legislature pass by cross-party consensus. There's not a roll call vote. And so the caucus leaders get together in a room, hammer out a compromise, and then it's approved by a uh, voice vote. And so um, the images of the legislature that most people have are of people throwing pig guts at each other and, and being yeah, for sure. And yeah. It looks completely chaotic. But behind the scenes, it actually uh, involves a lot of uh, cross party negotiation and compromise. And uh, so my my optimistic take, this may be maybe a little bit too positive or too optimistic, but um, I don't think it's a, a dramatic shift from current practice if the president is held by one party and the legislature is divided among several parties, none of whom have a majority. They will still, I think, find a way to work things out. On a lot so of you would, uh, so you would say that things are really different from the Chen Shui Bian era. I think KMT we are was... a different era. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it's um, the two issues that. Well, the one big issue that really divides the parties and leads to partisan showdowns are prostrate issues, right? Uh, anything involving right. uh, the relationship with China. Um, and number two, if the if the government tries to do something that's unpopular, and sometimes they do that, I think for the right reasons. They, you know, the public as a whole may oppose it, but it's um, so. I'm an American. I think the import of U.S. pork. Uh, mm -hmm. was a good thing. And I think the Thai administration should have pushed that through. Uh, they did over vehement opposition from the KMT and other parties. And uh, the reason the opposition opposed it so vehemently was because of uh, polls that were showing that that move was unpopular. And so they can really go after the Thai administration. But if there's if there's a measure that is uh, where there's a broad kind of public consensus or no kind of clear uh, support or opposition, I think you'll see compromise in the legislature and, you know, stuff that needs to be passed will be passed. I see. Because I feel like the referendum was such a, I was working at the KMT during the referendum times. And it, I think the referendum had like a 41%, 42% turnout rate. Right. And a lot of it has to do, I'm pretty sure a lot of people went there because of the uh, referendum of the on the pork. Uh, um, yeah. And this really raised a concern for me just personally about how the Taiwanese public, in my opinion, are, are really not that focused on domestic policies. And it is because of the like the news and like, you know, political parties talking about like the pork referendum that people actually went out to vote. And 41 percent, in my opinion, is quite low. So yeah. I was just, you know, I've been really worried about how this presidential election would turn out and whether people are actually debating on domestic policy issues. Um, cause you know, from my personal observations, nuclear power plants and like everything related to that in Taiwan has not been discussed thoroughly yet. Um, I've never seen, I, I watched the newest presidential, um, debate, I think yeah. in, on Taishi, uh, I don't know. It's just from my personal point of view, it's, it's not that emphasis, you know, it's not really highlighted. So that was just one of my concerns. Um, but yeah, yeah circling, well, yeah. Uh, so let me say on the referendums, that's a fairly new tool. Uh, mm -hmm. DPP uh, lowered the threshold to qualify referendums for the ballot, I think in 2018, maybe 2017, 18 in there. Uh, mm -hmm. And since then, everybody's used it as just a partisan weapon. It hasn't really been <laughs> a way to resolve yeah. complex policy issues that divide the public. It's been used as a way to kind of stick it to the DPP or stick yeah. it to the DPP. And as a result, there's a very strong partisan framing on each of those questions. And I mean, the reason the turnout was so low in that one ref set of referendums was because the DPP said boycott these, right? Um, yeah. And so the 
uh, either boycott or vote no, either one, but it, it has to press this, this uh, double threshold. And if it doesn't, it doesn't pass. Um, so um, the, that tool, I don't think has been uh, used as effectively as it could be. And it's, I think the design of it is a bit flawed, honestly. Um, so I, I, uh, I think the referendum kind of conversation is a bit of a sideshow and, and uh, also just generally, um, you know, the reason we have representative government is we, we select people to actually study the issues carefully and, and try to sort out uh, what makes the most sense. And in an ideal world, they're, you know, kind of weighing the pros and cons and they making a decision. So you as an ordinary voter don't have to. And if you trust this person, you reelect them to do that. So um, the, I, I know there's a lot of uh, fervent direct democracy proponents in Taiwan, but I think the, the referendum um, uh, tool that, that, uh, uh, that option uh, in Taiwan politics has not uh, enhanced the quality of Taiwan's democracy so far. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And I feel like a lot of political parties, they run on, for example, KMT, they run on the platform that, you know, they're the one that can stop a potential war from China. And yeah. thus a lot of people vote for them. But mm -hmm. what's your take on that? The idea of a potential U.S.-China war, U.S., uh, I mean, China-Taiwan war, you know, how has that sort of played out during past elections and how do you envision it to play out in this election? Yeah, um, so uh, both in 2016 and 2020, I think the salience of the China factor was high and it worked to the benefit of the DPP. So Tsai Ing-wen won big in 2016 uh, for for many reasons, that, that win was overdetermined, but uh, the biggest takeaway was that the large majority of the Taiwan public was much more skeptical of economic integration with China, right? China had changed from the way it was in 2008, and it looked much more threatening and menacing in 2016 than it did in 2008. And uh, so uh, as the party that everybody knows is more skeptical of China, the DPP was well positioned to take advantage of that shift in public opinion. Uh, in 2020, the concern was about Hong Kong uh, and the, the protests in Hong Kong and Beijing, frankly, reneging on all of their promises to maintain a high level of autonomy for Hong Kong and one country, two systems. And that's the model that's on offer from Beijing for Taiwan as well. And so um, the sense that uh, Hong Kong today, Taiwan tomorrow, that Taiwan is Taiwan's own sovereignty and security and its democracy are potentially imminently threatened if you don't vote the right way. That was, I remember very clearly that being palpable in the 2020 election. Um, and that was part due to the candidate the KMT nominated as well. He, uh, whatever else you might say about Han Guoyu, he was not um, positioning himself as uh, equally as skeptical of China and uh, and he did not have a reputation as being someone who would be very cautious and careful and a sober kind of manager of cross-strait relations, right? So um, I, I think in both of those elections, the China factor really helped the DPP and hurt the KMT. This election, uh, ironically, I think the chatter in the U.S. about uh, the, the rising threat from China to Taiwan um, is potentially changing how voters think about uh, who to vote for uh, in a way that's beneficial to the KMT. Uh, and the logic goes like this. So the KMT is uh, the party that Beijing will talk to. Um, and it's, they have a pretty credible case that uh, Beijing prefers them over the DPP. If you vote KMT, uh, there's a good chance that Beijing may walk back some of their military exercises. They may lift some of the economic uh, restrictions or, you know, kind of arbitrary imposition, or arbitrary uh, bans on imports and, uh, and maybe give Taiwan some more diplomatic space. And the KMT leans into this narrative, right? This is, we, we can talk to Beijing, we won't sacrifice Taiwan's security and sovereignty, but uh, unlike the DPP, Beijing, um, likes us or Beijing will play with us, right? Uh, and uh, 
if you are really worried about a war in the next four years, well, that's within the next term. That's the pre you're selecting the president who will be in office when that happens, right? And so if you don't want war, and I think most Taiwanese don't, uh, then the KMT has a, a decent case to make that they're the party that can buy peace. They can buy time, right? Because Beijing won't go to war with them. And uh, it's up to the Taiwan voters to decide how credible that is. But I think uh, given my conversations with people over the last year in Taiwan and what polls are showing, I actually think that is a more, um, it, it's a pitch that is making inroads in parts of the electorate that were much more skeptical of the KMT in 2020 and 2016. Um, and so, and I, my biggest worry is that the U.S. side especially people who aren't speaking for the Biden administration, but members of Congress or people in the foreign policy commentariat are saying, ah, Xi Jinping's gonna come from Taiwan really soon. Um, yeah. You know, war is right around the corner. And if you really believe that, if you think, wow, that guy in Washington DC seems to know something I don't, <laughs> I should be scared. Well, I mean, the, the options are, uh, we spend 10% of GDP on the military next year and give everybody an AK-47, or we elect the KMT. And uh, you know, one of those options turns us into Ukraine in the KMT's narrative about this, and the other option buys us peace. So why wouldn't you choose option two, right? Uh, so I think there's actually, a, there's a stronger case that the KMT can make this time around than they have in the last two elections. And the, the DPP is a little bit on the defensive, even though I think they, they, you know, they have very little to be blamed for in the cross-strait relationship other than Beijing hates them. Beijing is just pathologically uh, skeptical of anybody from the DPP. You know, Tsai Ing-wen mm -hmm. is the most That's moderate true. DPP president they are ever going to get. Uh, she's probably the best president the U.S. is ever going to get. Um, and despite all of that, the cross-strait relationship has gotten a lot worse. There are now regular military exercises around Taiwan. Taiwan's lost diplomatic allies and so forth. And, and so a vote for the DPP, whether they like it or not, is a vote for present trends to continue. Uh, and so as if you are, as a voter, are unhappy with present trends, then there's a real case to be made to to vote either KMT or vote Coenja because they offer some kind of alternative. Yeah, I think Coenja also runs on the platform that he has, you know, organized a, a lot of events with China before. Uh, I think the double city, I think it's called the double city event or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, do you think that because TPP is like a newer party, it doesn't really have sort of like the historical burdens of the KMT or the DPP that yeah it is actually a more appealing for Taiwanese voters to vote for him. Yeah, um, well, you've said it yourself, young people are really the, the group that is, uh, to which the TPP is most appealing. Um, the polls, I mean, there's lots of polls on this race. Uh, and I always go to the age breakdown in polls because the Delta there, the difference between people over 60 and under 40 in terms of support mm -hmm. for good is, astoundingly large and some of it it's you know people under 40 are supporting Ku. you know a few months ago they were voicing support for Ku at about a 50 percent rate in some polls like half of the under 40s said Ku is the best right and then you go to the over 60s and it's five percent right that's yeah. huge right i've never yeah. seen a huge gap that big before in taiwan for any race um and so what that tells me is that young people uh i'm calling under 40s young people here, but uh, so people under 40 are, uh, you know, generally don't have much attraction to the, they're not attracted to the KMT, uh, but they're also equally sick of the DPP at this point. And so Coenja offers some kind of alluring alternative. Um, whereas for older voters, well, number one, their partisan identification is much stronger. They tend to be, and we know this from, from comparative political science literature, once you develop partisanship, it's hard to change. It's, it's rare for a partisan to abandon their party and uh, vote for somebody else. Uh, and so the kind of return of, of say, pan-blue voters back to the KMT ticket in the latter stages of this race, I think is entirely, should be entirely expected. Uh, and it's the younger voters right now who are kind of shifting between all three camps potentially, uh, but who 
um, you know, if they voted for the DPP four years ago, are uh, seem to be very reluctant to do that again this time around. And Ke, I think Ke's presence uh, is probably hurting the DPP candidate more than the KMT candidate at this point. Oh, it used to be the complete opposite. Yeah, yeah right. It's a, uh, um, <laughs> and I don't. I'm not sure how many people have really picked up on this, but the pan blue base is really consolidated finally behind Hoyoki mm. after November 24th, and. Uh, so Ko Wenja's remaining support seems to be concentrated among younger people who overwhelmingly voted for Tsai Ing-wen four years ago and who now are uh, much less enamored with Lai Chinga. Uh, many of them would never consider voting for a KMT president, uh, but uh, are also um, unhappy with the DPP and might cast a protest vote for Ko Wenja. And so in a hypothetical world where Ko is not there, um, I think either those voters reluctantly vote for Lai or they sit this one out. And so I think Kuz at this point is probably hurting the DPP more than the KMT. Do you think that there is going to be a war between China and Taiwan? Um, well, let's put a timeline on it. I do not think so in the next five years. Um, I think it's actually quite low, the probability of that. Um, uh, but the probability is not zero. And there are things that Taiwan and the U.S. could do to lower that probability further. Um, you know, certainly Taiwan's efforts to uh, strengthen its own defenses are a critical part of ensuring there's not a conflict. Um, one way that we know wars start uh, from international relations research is overconfidence by one side that they could uh, launch a war, wrap it up quickly, um, change the status quo before anybody else has time to react. And then they're just, uh, they're presented with a, uh, a fait accompli, a result that's already uh, wrapped up. And uh, if Taiwan is in a position where it can actually, you know, fight off an initial invasion um, or make things very ugly and very complicated for the PLA, uh, then that kind of lightning quick strike becomes much less uh, appetizing to someone like Xi Jinping. And uh, he will have a stronger incentive to remain patient. Um, the other piece of deterrence here is um, convincing Xi Jinping that neither the US nor Taiwan is pushing for de jure independence. Um, and you know, China's position on this has been very consistent over many decades that, um, moves towards independence are, um, are, will be seen in Beijing as uh, you know, a, a threat to one of their core interests. Um, and that they, even if they didn't think they had a, uh, a good chance of winning a war, they might feel compelled to launch one anyway, simply to uh, demonstrate where their bottom line is on Taiwan independence and they will never accept it. And so, um, the U.S. side uh, has for many years understood that and tried to straddle this line where um, we don't support independence, but we also um, don't push the Taiwanese towards unification. And uh, our position is that we, we want both sides of the straits to uh, agree um, together on any changes to the status quo. They can't be coerced. Uh, and so um, we're in a situation right now where the Beijing side does not fully trust U.S. assurances on this issue um, and uh, has asked or even demanded that Biden say the United States not only does not support independence, but also does not oppose unification. That's actually part of the U.S.'s one China policy. Um, and the Biden administration has not done that uh, recently. Um, it's not uh, impossible that they could do that at some point in the near future, I think. Um, it, and it wouldn't be a departure, uh, a change to the U.S. one China policy. I see. And how do you see the Taiwanese media play into this? Because I'm pretty sure, I mean, your own personal experience with the Taiwanese media, you know, being misquoted. Um, <laughs> You know, you have a pretty, pretty interesting personal experience with with the media. So, yeah, how do how do you see the Taiwanese media play a role into this sort of the debate on whether there's going to be a war or not? Yeah, well, there's certainly 
uh, so first off, Taiwan media is very partisan. Uh, there are very few outlets that are clearly professional, nonpartisan, trusted sources of information. Uh, and most voters know that. And so, you know, if you've got a report in Lianhe Bao and another report in Ziyo Shi Bao, um, mm -hmm. and they say opposite things, well, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or you can kind of triangulate, you know, it's, um, um, but uh, I do think there are certain narratives that are, are pushed uh, for partisan goals uh, in say the blue media outlets and green media outlets that um, are, well, let, let, me, let me cut this two ways again. Older voters tend to consume more traditional media um, and uh, at higher rates. So they're the ones actually buying a paper copy of Lan Ho Bao or Zi Yo Shi Bao. Um, and so the message that kind of, or, or they're the ones watching blue TV or green TV as well. Um, younger voters tend to consume much of their political news online, either from YouTube or from Facebook or uh, on other social media platforms. Um, and I have a much, uh, a much weaker grasp of how that younger, um, those, those alternative sources of information are affecting how people think about this election. And uh, so if I, uh, one request of researchers is to drill into um, the emergence of alternative media and to study the impact on how attitudes and political knowledge are, are shaped by, by that, uh, by media consumption, different, different uh, media outlets. Um, um, I do think there's uh, there's a possibility that disinformation or some kind of narrative laundering uh, happens uh, from you know that that originates in mainland China um, and is pushed into the Taiwan media ecosystem in a way that harms uh, candidates on the green end of the spectrum and probably helps candidates on the blue end of the spectrum. But uh, I actually think the the chatter about this, the conversation about disinformation and its impact on the election kind of misses the bigger challenge, which is what China does overtly towards Taiwan. So, um, you know, their efforts to uh, inject disinformation into the ecosystem, I think matter maybe on the margins, maybe with, you know, a handful of, of groups, uh, you know, might swing a vote here or there, but uh, the narrative that I just gave about why voters might want to vote for the KMT this time versus four or eight years ago is entirely driven by what China is doing in the open, right? It's very clear that they will treat a DPP presidency different than they will treat a KMT presidency, right? Uh, and that is overt manipulation of the Taiwan election. Unlike the US, China has a clear favorite in this election and everybody knows it. Uh, and so um, when people raise the specter of disinformation delegitimizing this election, I say, you know, <laughs> the, the that may matter on the margins, but the big thing here is Beijing and what they're doing openly and their military exercises, their economic sanctions, and and so on and so forth. So, um, so if there's one thing that I think the U.S. needs to do a better job of pushing back against, it's actually the overt coercion that Beijing is using to try to use influence this election. Forget the disinformation piece. Look at what's out in the open. My final question for you is on Taiwan's foreign policy. So mm -hmm. what's your view on countries with formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan? Because, you know, Taiwan has spent vast amounts of resources sustaining these ties. But are these act, are these ties actually that important for Taiwan? Well, they, in one sense, yes, they're super important. They maintain Taiwan's claim to be uh, a state in the international system with all of the privileges and responsibilities that go along with that. Um, and so even though the Republic of China on Taiwan is not part of the UN uh, and it's not it, it doesn't have rights and privileges in most international bodies. If it has these formal diplomatic relationships with other countries, it can still say, well, we should be, we should be part of that. We shouldn't be so diplomatically isolated. Uh, and uh, these, 
uh, allies around the world can raise uh, proposals in these international bodies where Taiwan doesn't have representation. And so um, in that kind of symbolic sense, it's actually very important. But uh, if you look at the kind of practical day-to-day -day interactions that Taiwan and the Taiwanese people have with the rest of the world, they matter very little. Uh, and it's actually their in Taiwan's informal relationships with Japan and the United States and South Korea and Europe and so forth that matter. I mean, you can visit the United States now. Uh, the, the, um, Americans can go to Taiwan visa-free and vice versa, right? Uh, that is a much bigger privilege than uh, having a formal diplomatic relationship with Nauru <laughs> um, because it, uh, it it has a much bigger impact on the day-to-day -day lives of many Taiwanese. Um, the fact that the new Taiwan dollar is readily convertible um, and uh, is recognized as an international currency. Banks don't refuse to use the new Taiwan dollar, right? That matters a lot more for Taiwan's economy than whether uh, Nicaragua recognizes Taiwan or not. So, um, uh, and then finally, the uh, there's a kind of extreme version of this argument that says, well, you know, Beijing is constantly trying to pick a, you know, uh, to to poach Taiwan's remaining diplomatic allies, uh, and if they get it down to zero, uh, they should be careful what they wish for, because then Taiwan has, um, then Taiwan could say, well. You know, the Republic of China now is recognized by nobody, uh, but we will declare ourselves Taiwan. We will just jettison any remaining claim to the Republic of China legacy in the interstate system and set up a new country called Taiwan and uh, invite people to recognize us that way. And so they'd be in kind of a similar situation to, say, Palestine or some of the other uh, unrecognized nations and peoples out there. Um, and, and making similar kinds of appeals. And Beijing may not want, actually like <laughs> what that, uh, the practical consequences of, of being at, at zero. Um, yeah, I mean, if there's nothing to lose, it poses yes. like more threats to the PRC because yes, exactly. you can never predict it's what's actually, gonna happen. In, in a sense, because Taiwanese leaders are and, and the public are so concerned about this, uh, these remaining diplomatic ties, uh, they are deterred, in a sense, from doing things that Beijing might really not like. Um, Beijing can threaten to poach some more. But if Beijing is doing that anyway, well, then why not push for Taiwan to be recognized as just Taiwan rather than the Republic of China? Oh, I see. I've never really thought of that because the the barrier to amend the Constitution is so high. We haven't seen an, a yeah. single amendment in Taiwan for the, in the past, I think, 10 to 20 years. Yeah. Since 2005. Yeah, since 2005. Yeah, so I never really thought about the possibility of that, but that was a really interesting point. Um, yeah, so this is all the questions I have for you today. Thank you so much for being interviewed by me today. And Thanks for yeah. having me on. Thank you.